everyone and welcome to the NG Podcast. I'm Marcus Einstein, your host. In the NG Podcast, we hope to bring you content that's of interest to anyone involved in enteral feeding, whether you're a healthcare professional, a patient or a carer. We hope you enjoy this episode and if you do, please subscribe or like on whichever platform you're either viewing or listening to this on. Here we go. This week's episode is part of the NG Podcast partnership with Pint to support their Talk About Hand campaign by talking to people who use artificial nutrition. This week I'm joined by Jenny Easton, a Pint member who uh, has used enteral nutrition for six years through a gastrostomy to meet her nutritional and hydration needs. She's had various tubes and various degrees of success with them, which I'm sure we will end up talking about. Jenny, welcome to the NG podcast. We are delighted that you could join us. Thank you for asking me. It would be good to share my happenings with other people. Yeah, that, and I think that's one of the things that we're, we're definitely trying to do on, on this series with Pint is to help people understand that everyone who's artif- who has, uses artificial nutrition is different and has to adapt in a different way. Um, so um, you've been using enteral feeding in one form uh, or another but uh, for about six years, but your journey to enteral feeding started a long time before that. Can you describe how things began and progressed for you? Yes. In the 1990s, about the late 1990s, my my voice started being very croaky and coughing when I was eating. So I saw the doctor and he sent me to a consultant. They could put a camera down but could find absolutely nothing wrong at all. So Mm -hmm. fast forward another 15, 20 years, and I got rheumatoid arthritis, and I was in the clinic there, and the nurse there, who I'd known for a good many years, said to me that day, your voice is very weak today. Have you had it checked out again lately? I said, no. She said, well, do so. So the following week on the Monday, I saw my GP and he said, yes, I think we ought to. So on the Tuesday that the day after, I had an x-ray on my throat. At the end of the week, I saw a consultant and I said, gosh, this is all quick. And they said, well, you know, could be cancer, so we've got to speed things up. So the consultant on that Friday put a tube down and he said, your vocal cord isn't working. I don't know why. So he arranged an MRI scan and a CT scan. The CT scan was first and I happened to be allergic to the dye in it, which wasn't (laughs) good. So saw the consultant after the CT scan and he said, you've got a tumour there, so we want to have an MRI scan. So I had that. And this is all within about six weeks. And mm-hmm. saw the consultant again and he said, yes, there is a tumour there. I'm pretty sure it's a paraganglioma and it's benign, but we will want to remove it. So I said, fine. So I saw another head and neck surgeon and he said, oh yes, we'll remove it. You'll probably be in hospital about five days maximum. That'd be fine. So I said, okay. So it all, um, I went to hospital in June June the 17th, a few days before my birthday. So I thought, oh, I'll be home for my birthday. Great. So I had the <laughs> surgery. And um, obviously, I was out for quite a while. But my daughter could tell me that when she spoke to them after the operation, 
It took a lot longer than they anticipated because the tumour was actually, they likened it in the middle of a tree with all the branches around it. So it was very wow. difficult to get out. And uh -huh. in doing so, it was wrapped around the vagus nerve as well. So I couldn't swallow. And mm -hmm. so when I came to, um, they said, explain what they'd done and slip me kind of all the way down. And I uh, had a nasal tube at the time. And, you know, I thought, oh, this, okay. I felt really quite well. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll be home within a few days. And the days went past. <laughs> And I had another videooscopy to see if I could swallow or not. And they realized I couldn't. So um, I was on the nasal tube, but, but with the nasal tube, and you're not continually feeding, you have to aspirate. They draw kind of fluid off mm -hmm. afterwards to make sure the tube is in the right place. Well, with me, they could never aspirate for some reason. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever came up. So I'd okay. end up in a and &E X-ray department in the middle of the night, checking that the tube was in the right place. Mm -hmm. I could tell you a few stories about that as well. Um, mm. <laughs> and um, eventually, kind of, Four weeks in, they said, we're going to put a peg in. And again, I thought, well, this is only temporary. I went home on the, I think it was the Wednesday afternoon. I had terrible problems with saliva and coughing and with a nasal tube as well. I'd coughed it up one day, which wasn't pleasant. Mm -hmm. I went, and I hardly was told much about the peg tube at all in the hospital. And yeah. uh, they kind of supervised my bolus feeding. I didn't have much to do with it. So I came yeah, home yeah. feeling really unwell. And I had pneumonia. And I was rushed back in the next day for another week. But that mm. extra week, I was on um, a chest ward that time. I, I had mm -hmm. been on ENT before. And again, they didn't really know much about tubes, but I had time to kind of learn what to do. But I didn't get much help. It was trial and error mm -hmm. myself. And then mm -hmm. I was home. Mm. So... Yeah, quite a steep learning curve. Yeah, so, and I guess, you know, you'd had a, like you said, you'd had a very sort of long history of uh, an issue with your voice. Then you had something, it was really quite quick and they moved yeah. really fast. And I have to say, yes. well done to that nurse who said you need to get that uh, checked out uh, yes. because that's a, that's a really good spot. But you went into hospital able to eat and drink Yes. And you weren't expecting to come out unable to. No. no what way. was it? What was it like adjusting to all of a sudden not being able to eat and drink? Well, it was horrible because especially my room in the hospital was outside which they served all the meals, lunchtime and evening. Oh. So I had all the smells and everything all the time. Not pleasant. Mm. But as I said, it, I didn't accept in my mind that it was long term. I thought, yeah. oh, I'll be able to eat soon. I did try a bit of ice cream or custard in the hospital, but it just collected in my mouth and I couldn't get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 when you came out, um, again, 
with the, I guess, with the nasogastric tube to start off with. No, um, it was a, a peg. Oh, you came out with a peg. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, so you, you had an NG for a while in hospital. Then they put the peg in before you came home. Yeah. So, what what was it like getting back to, you know, life outside hospital? You know, the the impact on family occasions, celebrations, and things when you couldn't you couldn't eat or drink. Well, I live alone. So it was me trying to kind of come around to everything. I did mm-hmm. have one friend came down um, to see me, but she wouldn't eat in the same room at first. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so I wasn't around other people eating, which in some ways was good. In other ways, mm-hmm. it wasn't so good. But when kind of Christmas came round six months later, it was horrible sitting at a table with seven other people all eating their Christmas dinner and me not able to have a thing because the first year nothing went in my mouth. Yeah, yeah. And and, and was it it as much how you felt about it or was it sometimes about people's reaction both to you both. not doing it mm. yeah both uh, yes and the worst uh, thing i found at christmas was that people left food on their plates they'd held themselves mm. too much and i thought oh i wish i could eat that you know mm. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh, and uh, i think um you mentioned an incident when you went out, I think it was with friends to a restaurant and and other people in the restaurant or another person in the restaurant reacted um, quite badly no, to the fact that you were... Yes, I wanted some water, just plain water, and obviously that went through the tube as well. And I went to the toilets to do it in private because where can you go to do these things? Yeah, uh, apart from the toilet, which isn't hygienic. So I was stood by the wash basins, injecting myself with water through the peg. And this woman came in, took one look at me and ran out again. And I, I called out to her, I said, it's not drugs, it's water. But she was um, horrified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of, uh, I think we've got... Um, some other guests coming on who have had sort of similar misconceptions and, and, you know, quite bad reactions from people who haven't taken the time to even blink, I guess, uh, you know, to, to try or to try and consider what the situation could really be. And it just shows you how, you know, we, we we do tend to judge very quickly uh, and not consider how that might make people feel. I was very apprehensive about bolus feeding in a restaurant, mm. you know, while yeah. my friend's family were eating. And of course, you're lifting up your top and all your middle showing. And someone said to me, well, it's just like breastfeeding. People do that. So why can't mm. you do what you're doing? Yeah. But you do well, get and, and that- looks. And that and that's a really good way for someone to look at it. But let's face it, uh, there are a number of people in society that don't like the idea of breastfeeding exactly. in public either. So you know, yeah. it's um, uh, so so. I guess that's um, you know, bolus feeding has is going to cause a reaction as well if if breastfeeding does. Yes. Um, what are the other? You know, so so that's kind of going into restaurants um just thinking about other ways people who were using enteral feeding have to adapt um one of the things people often struggle with is is the enteral feeding um if they're going on holiday do you, do you oh, still go on holidays or or, or or have you stopped that no when i was retired i retired well mm seven, eight years ago, I thought, oh, yes, I can travel a bit more, go to see my sister in Australia. You know, I was really looking forward mm. to it. 
but this has all stopped it. No, mm. no. And I go with friends. And they have to, you know, if we share a, a room, kind of, they have to listen to my pump whirring away mm. all night. You know, you don't get reductions if you're in a hotel, if you're not eating breakfast. No. And uh, one B&B we did, the woman, the owner kept on all through the break, breakfast. Are you sure you can't eat anything? Don't you want something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not easy. And no. I'd love to go abroad again. And I mm. phoned up Saga because they have escorted tours and I've mm -hmm. used them before, before the tube. And I said, if I travel alone or with a friend, I'll have my food in the trunk and then I've got my own baggage. Could I have some help? No, was the answer. You've got to manage it all by yourself. Well, when you... I'm nearly 74. It's not mm -hmm. easy at the best of times, let alone no. anything else. So what we do now is go self-catering. I've got two very good friends and we have a bigger place so that we can all have a room and hopefully yeah. a bathroom each. I've just come back from Pembrokeshire with them and it was lovely. But, you know, yeah. they're eating... They feel guilty that I'm not eating much. Yeah. And so on. I did manage mm. to go to the Isles of Scilly with a friend. And mm -hmm. we went down, because I live in Bristol, went down by car to Penzance, stayed in the B&B &B overnight. Then the food trunk went on the ferry Mm -hmm. And we flew over in the tin can because it's um, <laughs> well, it's seat six. And yeah, it's literally a tin can. It takes fifteen minutes, <laughs> and you hope so, that the food is going to get there. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's very brave of you to let it go through a, a different route than you're going on. I think um, often people almost watch watch the trunk onto the plane and wait anxiously. So so yeah. did you have to pick it up at the ferry port or did they deliver yeah, it to they where you were staying? It. They delivered it. So that's really yeah. good. For a cost that's of one pound fifty. <laughs> wow. Well I have to say that's a that's a top tip then. They, they'll look after you on the Isles of Silly if you if yes. you need entral feeding. Yes. yes. So um but then I also I've got friends in Yorkshire and in the Lake District. And I arrange for my food to be delivered up there. Mm. And I make sure it's delivered two days before I go. So yeah. I know it's there. And I know yeah. it will be delivered anywhere in the world, apart from yeah. the Far East. But they advise you to take a week's supply anyway. Yeah. So if yeah. A week supply is a lot. <laughs> it's a trend. Yeah. yeah, 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 it is, it is. Uh, it's an awful lot. Well, I'm very pleased that you managed to come up to, to, to God's country in Yorkshire sometimes. Well, Gisborough, do you call that Yorkshire? Just... I, I, was born in, I was born in Gisborough. Were you? <laughs> I was, yeah, yeah. That's where my mum's family are from, so... I, I know Gisborough very well. And it was in North Yorkshire when I was born there. Yes. So I am a Yorkshireman. Uh, but it's in Cleveland now, which isn't yeah. really a county. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, um, so so in general, so we've talked about the really tough stuff, the holiday piece. Um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, how do you use your enteral feeding? And do you have um, do you have a standard routine? Yes, I, uh, me. <clears throat> I feed 10 hours via a pump overnight because yeah. I'd rather it 
long and slow, so I don't have to get up in the middle of the night and flush myself with water, etc., etc. Yeah. I'd never get back to sleep. No. And now I can have a little bit through my mouth. I have a yogurt for breakfast. Then I bolus feed lunchtime. And I mm-hmm. have a bit of soup tea time. Mm. Mm. So that I so, so, do it. I do it regularly as if I was kind of a normal person. You are a normal person. You just Thank have you. enteral feed. <laughs> so, Carol in the chair of pints going to have words with you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 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 how how long have you been able to have uh, you know a bit of yogurt and a bit of soup? I'd say four years. All right, but okay. But it's at my own risk. Yes. Yeah. No, so, yes. so, 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 what makes you take the risk? What What has it added to you to 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 do that? Just to be a bit normal. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're digging a, a bigger hole for yourself. <laughs> yeah. To have a routine, to be able yeah. to go out with other people, yeah. and look as though you're enjoying yourself when you might not be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's not because of the food. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I know, I know, we talked a little bit about the uh, types of tube uh, that you you've had, and, and I, yes. I know you've had uh, more than more than just an NJ and a peg. I think you've had peg jays and things like that. Uh, and, and and one of the things that you, you mentioned was around you know if if you get a if a tube blocks or if you get a problem what it's like going you know trying to get that sorted out right you know are, th- are there any specific incidents that you, you kind of recall that illustrate Absolutely. what sort of problems <laughs> yes um the peg j was fitted a month after the peg because i had a bit of reflux and a chest infection. So I saw my GP and he referred me to the hot clinic at my local hospital. That yeah. wasn't the hospital that fitted the peg. Okay. Mm. So they didn't have my notes. So when I saw the chest consultant, he said, did I get reflux? I said, yes. He said, well, I think you ought to have a peg J. So I said, okay. And I was still having terrible problems with saliva then. And he thought this would be the best answer. So he said, I'll get someone to do it for you today. So I saw an Intraventral radiologist, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, no anaesthetic, nothing, just lie on the table and we'll do it. But it filled me with confidence because he had his instruction book on how to do it by his side. <laughs> and he kept saying, Oh, I can't get this tube in. It won't go around the corner and things like that. I was there for hours while he was trying to do it. A very nice training nurse was talking to me the whole while, trying to kind of um, distract me, to want a better way. Mm-hmm. So when he'd finished, he, I said, right, what about feeding? Can I still bolus feed? Oh, yes, no problem, no problem. So I was ravenous by this stage. So I go yeah. home. Luckily, I'm, well, five miles at the most from the hospital. So mm-hmm. I tried to bolus feed. Of course, you can't do it, can you? With a peg J. He yeah. thought you could. So I phoned him up 
And he said, oh, come back in. I'll see if it's blocked. So I go back in the same afternoon and he tried to get food through a syringe down. Oh, yes, of course, he was a strong young man. He could push through. <laughs> yeah. On my way out of the hospital, I bumped into, literally, the chess consultant. And he said, oh, how did you get on? I said, the only problem is feeding. And he said, you need to get in touch with your nutrition nurse. And mm -hmm. so I did when I got home. And she said, of course you can't bolus feed with a peg J. You need a pump. Mm. Yeah. He'd been adamant um, that I could. Mm -hmm. And um, I did have an apology from him in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. And, and good. you know, it's unfortunate for you, but at least he learned something and he'll never forget it. <laughs> yes. The other, a uh, couple of other things were that, um, you know, it blocks with antibiotics, the head tube, because your antibiotics go through, and they often block the tube, and you end up in A&E. And a couple of times I've been there and said, oh, I've never seen anything like this before. But the worst one was when the peg J came apart from the peg. And as you know, the peg itself is minute, the tube, mm -hmm. and the peg J is inside it. Well, it literally came adrift and I could see it going down the peg. So again, yeah. Friday night, go speak to nutrition nurse first. And she said, well, go down to a and &E. I'll tell them you're coming. So I go down to a and &E. Oh, yes, we know you're coming. Go up to kind of the admissions ward and see the gastro chap that's on duty tonight. And he was on duty. Oh, I've never seen anything like this before. I haven't a clue. And this was the gastro chap. Yeah. It was the end of his shift. And he said, oh, I really don't know what to do. I can admit you, but it probably won't be Monday or Tuesday before you see anybody or you mm -hmm. can go home. And I said, well, I can still feed through the peg, because mm -hmm. that's okay. And a fortnight later, they called me in to take the tube out. And I said, could I see the consultant before he did it? Because normally you're sedated and you don't really have anything to do with them. So I talked to him and I said, because my body probably wasn't ready for tubes initially, can I go back to trying just an ordinary peg? And he said, yes. So I've done that for the last two years and mm. so far so good. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, settled down for you. It's, um, but, I, you know, I, I, do, I mean, it, it's something it's something that um other people have said you know even though um a lot of people use enteral feeding now it's actually a relatively small number of healthcare professionals that really mm. understand them maybe yeah yeah you you would you, i guess you would hope so you would hope so <laughs> you're probably making all these people go off and and investigate yeah. and learn something. <laughs> it's just it's just a shame it's you that's uh, yes. that's having to to go through it to uh, yeah. to to help other people learn. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so so um, you know, like I said, there's quite a lot of people who you certainly use artificial nutrition 
in general, you know, but enteral feeding as well. Um, and Pint is is really the the, the biggest organisation for uh, people who use artificial nutrition. How did you get involved in Pint, and and how has it helped you? My daughter googled artificial feeding when I was in the hospital, and um, kind of enrolled me as a member before I knew it. All right. And then, a couple of months in, there was a meeting, a pint meeting, and I went to it. And it was good to see other people in the same boat because I hadn't mm -hmm. seen anybody else, you know, mm -hmm. because I wasn't on a tube board initially. Yeah. I hadn't seen anybody using one before. No. And I went to that meeting. And I must admit, a lot of it went over my head because I was just in denial. Thought, yeah. you know, I'll be out of this in a couple of days or weeks. And then I've been to other meetings, and it's just so good to exchange talks and discuss, you know, symptoms with other people in the same mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. And Pint, yeah. you know, organising it. And I went to their, one of their annual meetings. And it was so mm -hmm. informative. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a great organisation. I mean, that's why I guess we we were really happy to be able to help put this series together. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I think um, the, 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 I guess the community of people who use artificial nutrition are massive support to each other. And, yes. you know, I think, I think we're going to do a, um, another episode, which is uh, someone's been doing a bit of research into top tips, uh, yes, for, you know, so. things you wish you'd known to start <laughs> off with. So, so, so we're going to, uh, I think we're going to uh, do an episode on that as well. So um, listen, Jenny, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and your experience with us. I, I know it will really help other people in a similar situation and healthcare professionals who, who care for artificially fed people mm -hmm. to understand the impact it's had yeah. on your everyday life. And we really appreciate you being a guest as part of the uh, Pint Talk About Hand campaign. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, being on. Uh, and and maybe we'll see you at a pint event soon when we can uh, well, all hopefully. get together that way. Yes. Well, thank listen. You. Thank you so. Thank you so much. Uh, goodbye. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah.